So Nicholas gave us an excellent global outlook of the economy, and I wanted to reflect that in a ratings perspective. So uh, he talked about the challenges that we faced, and I think this fact captures um, this very clearly. In 2016, it's going to be a record year for sovereign downgrades from Fitch, and upgrades haven't been very or have been falling uh, compared to previous years. Now, I think this is quite a staggering thought, given the fact that um, we've been through. 2007 to uh, 2008 global financial crisis. We've been through the euro area crisis. So why has things been different in over 2016? Now, here's a global forecast summary. It, uh, just to highlight the fact that growth has been weak uh, and it looks to be weakening. But in terms of what's different from between now and uh, compared to before is that we don't really have a pillar uh, in the global economy. China was a, uh, still a strong force for growth during 07 uh, and 2011. I won't talk too much about China given Jacket's presentation uh, following, but we, we just don't have really any support. And combining weak China with a weak global recovery, commodity prices have also been hit. And this gives a more pessimistic picture. So, um, as you can see on the chart on the left, negative outlooks considerably outweigh positive outlooks. Now, our definition of negative outlooks is our likelihood of a rating downgrade within a two, uh, one to two year time frame of over 50%. And so you can see negative outlooks are, uh, yeah, uh, the column on the left is very high. Although for Asia, it's a relatively balanced. So Asia is a relatively resilient uh, region for us. If you look at the specific countries that have been hit, you see that the majority are commodity producers. So two-thirds of the sovereign downgrades we've had in 2016 are to do with commodity producers. Now the question is, can Asia continue its outperformance relative to other regions, which is the focus of this presentation? This chart looks at uh, growth in 2016 relative to the 2010 to 2015 average. Now, you can see that there's quite a mix in terms of performance. You've got countries like India, Bangladesh, and Philippines that are, have a strong domestic sector and are less trade open, and so have gone through the weakness in global economy fairly uh, in a fairly resilient form. Whereas countries like Hong Kong, Taiwan, who are closer to China, have had a much sharper drop in growth. But compared to other regions, Asia has actually been quite resilient. Uh, only emerging Europe has performed better, and that's really to do with the Euro European economy recovering, but really not at the pace that many had expected. Now let's, let's try and break this down a little bit further and look in the components of what has changed in growth. And you can see that on the left is domestic factors and on the right is uh, external factors. Consumption has actually held up very well pretty much across regional emerging Asia. You have some differences in investment. You can see Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia having a weaker investment compared to the 2010 to 2015 average. That's largely to do with commodities-related uh, investments, so oil, um, uh, mining, uh, those sort of investments. And in Sri Lanka, it's more to do with external financing issues. But as a whole, domestic demand has held up pretty well. Externals are where there's been a problem. In general, exports have been hit across uh, the region. And this is no surprise given the state of the global economy and what we've seen in China. Imports have been a bit different, and that really depends on the uh, oil or commodity intensity of the countries involved. So a country like Thailand has benefited a huge amount by lower oil prices, and so imports have fallen by more than exports. But that varies considerably across the Asian region. But as a whole, external forces have been the cause of weakness in Asian economies. Now, in terms of looking ahead, I think um, there are two things that we need to balance out. The likelihood of external forces causing further weakness in the Asian region and the domestic pillars, whether they can sustain this continued resilience of domestic demand uh, going forward. Now, I'll start with trade openness. Now, uh, Nicholas has described the challenge that we faced uh, in terms of the global economy. Uh, I'm not going to go into further predictions. I'm just going to look at the vulnerabilities. 
and so trade openness uh, in this data shows um, this is the average of current account receipts and payments over GDP. So it represents how much, uh, how important external demand is to an economy. For countries like Singapore, Macau, and Taiwan, tied to China financial sector, uh, partly um, somewhat more vulnerable. And then you have um, countries like Vietnam and Thailand who are more trade focused. But as a whole, Asia is actually less trade open than other regions, which uh, is surprising to many, but actually domestic demand for countries like China, India, Japan are much more crucial. So as a region, trade is uh, less important, but given the increasing globalized economies that we have and the supply chain links, that's not exactly the whole picture and trade is uh, still a key. Now, commodities I mentioned was responsible for two-thirds of downgrades. Now, the commodity price downturn we've already started uh, seeing in 2013, why is it really affecting now? I think this charts show um, why. So if you can see, the, uh, this is the uh, government balance, the fiscal balance of uh, commodity exporters compared to non-commodity exporters in emerging markets, and also the current account balance. And you can see, because of the strength of commodity prices uh, in the past, because of this super cycle that we had prior to uh, the drop, fiscal positions and current accounts were sharply in surplus for emerging markets. And so even as commodity prices came down, we came from very strong to less strong. Now, as the commodity price um, declines have been sustained, we're starting this, to see this to feed through to the fiscal and external position to the point where Actually, for commodity exporters, uh, the, uh, the, those positions are worse than for non-commodity exporters. And this is the reason why it's uh, been in decline. And for countries, especially in the Middle East, the adjustment to this new normal has been challenging and has hit growth in terms of fiscal consolidation uh, and trying to adjust to the kind of decline in investment flows coming in. So can commodities is a challenge and could be a challenge going forward. Now, this chart looks at commodity dependence for Asian economies. Again, generally less than other regions, but very mixed. A country like Mongolia, which has just recently gone for an IMF program, has clearly been hit very hard by commodity price drops. But other countries, um, kind of, uh, as you can see in general, have not been hit so much. Now, Indonesia and Malaysia have also experienced a lot of external volatility over the last few years. Australia and New Zealand less so, partly because of uh, a flexible exchange rate that has helped uh, them to adjust very easily and also just an uh, increase in production. But as a whole, the Asian region is relatively less uh, exposed to commodities. Now, even though uh, there's the real economy side of things and there's the financial flow side and uh, commodity declines can be exacerbated by external finance vulnerabilities. And two ways of, uh, two metrics that we can look at in terms of uh, how vulnerable a country is to uh, financial risk is uh, the gross external financing requirement, which is how much the country needs to borrow uh, for next year to meet its current account deficit and also its uh, debt that's maturing over the next year, and also the level of reserves that it has. And so the, uh, the, um, on the chart, the countries nearer the bottom right are more vulnerable. And you can see um, in terms of Mongolia, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia, the countries that have seen the most volatility is quite readily captured on this chart. As with the kind of um, the, uh, the fragile five that's fr uh, frequently coined in the sense of Brazil, South Africa, and Turkey. Now the third vulnerability I want to speak on uh, in terms of uh, commodities and to external financing is leverage. Now, it's very hard to say what, what is the right level of leverage, um, um, what the leverage can be sustained, but an issue with high leverage is that it, it creates vulnerability should there be a shock. And you can see China has been a clear increase in, seen a clear increase in leverage over the last few years. Uh, but actually has also been uh, matched in some other regions such as um, Malaysia and Thailand. And then you can see that in Hong Kong and Japan. Japan more on the public side. But in general, leverage is pretty high in Asian economies. Now, the vulnerability that creates is 
on the external finances side uh, and also on domestic interest rates is um, higher leverage means that um, a country is more vulnerable to changes in financing conditions. Uh, and also from a monetary policy perspective, um, higher leverage makes it more difficult for lower interest rates to boost lending and counteract uh, a slowdown in growth. So leverage restricts a policy options domestically for an economy. Now, I'm going to jump into that a bit later, actually, um, and go, now we put this all together, uh, looking at high commodity dependence, high leverage, and weak external finances, uh, and then kind of putting our countries in a Venn diagram, you can see Mongolia is in the nexus of all three in terms of the vulnerabilities, and we've seen this in terms of um, the IMF program that they had and the external problems they faced. Malaysia and Indonesia both have uh, two vulnerabilities here quite clearly, and they've also faced quite a lot of um, external financing problems. But I think this captures very well the credit vulnerabilities individually across the regions that are faced. Now, how can, uh, do, do these countries have room to um, battle these domestically, or to deal with these vulnerabilities domestically? Monetary policy is one option. In 2015, so this chart on the x-axis shows the change in policy rates since 2015. The bubble size shows inflation in August 2016, and uh, the uh, y-axis shows nominal interest rates at current levels. You can see that given that most of the bubbles are left of the y-axis, we've seen a sustained amount of monetary uh, loosening across uh, Asian economies, to the point where for countries like Thailand and Korea, we're close to the zero bound where monetary policy is going to be increasingly challenging. Inflation has been low, which has helped the easing uh, momentum, but for some countries, inflation has been coming back up, and that would also be a constraint on monetary policy. Now, the question is, okay, uh, can fiscal policy come to uh, step in? Now, uh, Nicholas talked about how fiscal policy may not be the... Um, drive of growth in uh, the developed markets, but for Asia, it's a little bit different. We've already seen fiscal easing across a lot of economies. Um, so this chart shows uh, on the y-axis the um, 2016 to 2018 average expenditure to GDP compared to 2011 to 2015, uh, and then the bottom shows the same for revenue. So I wanted to capture the change in fiscal stance. So where countries' uh, expenditure is increasing by more than revenue, is what I would say is a fiscal loosening stance. It's not an exact measure. It's very hard to capture this uh, idea easily, but you can see on the left, generally the diamonds are left of the blue line, which suggests that most economies are loosening fiscal policy, uh, at least in the Asian, uh, re emerging Asian region. The question is, do they have room to do so? Um, this chart shows the uh, deficit on the left and the government debt on the right, and you can see that Fiscal room for a lot of economies it varies significantly. For countries like Sri Lanka and India, you don't really have much to, uh, that uh, fiscal space to do so. But for countries like Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, there is. Now, there's a, a question of uh, in terms of law, because for a lot of Asian economies, there are fiscal rules and uh, debt stability laws, which means that this doesn't necessarily capture the legal fiscal room that's available. But it does show what can be done at least from an economic uh, sustainability perspective. So I'll conclude just by saying um, in terms of external vulnerabilities, as Nicholas mentioned, there are plenty, but there are domestic pillars that can be sustained, but that is very much dependent on the economies that we have in Asia. So there's a huge um, differences, uh, at least in the kind of individual country level. Um, so when you're thinking about country risk, you should really monitor and not just the regional trends, but the individual economies.